up our Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 36. Exodus chapter 36. You know, as we think about the text that we have in front of us this morning, it'll be Exodus chapter 36 all the way to the end of the book of Exodus. I'm going to sort of summarize and make my way through four chapters actually this morning. And before you think of that with a note of dread, I think I have it organized well enough to where we can get out of here at a normal time. And if you are wondering, what are we going to do after? You see, our custom here at Calvary Chapel is to teach verse by verse through books of the Bible. It's not that we do that absolutely every Sunday, but certainly that's the foundation of what we do. And I'm very excited because what we're going to do next on Sunday mornings is go through uh, the letter to the Hebrews. Because it's such a great connection between the book of Exodus and then on to the New Testament letter to the Hebrews. But as I'm thinking about the text here for this morning, these four chapters that conclude the book of Exodus, I have to say my initial reaction is, what a strange thing for us to talk about here in the 21st century. I just imagine somebody walking in and thinking, how strange is it that you're talking about these things and these ancient rituals and these ancient structures and what possible relevance does this have for our present day? But I want you to be assured it has absolute relevance, relevance I should say, for our present day, especially in this, in many ways, but especially in this, in that what we're going to talk about this morning focuses on God's great desire to dwell with mankind. And God's desire to dwell with mankind did not end in the book of Exodus. It continues on to the present day. And we're going to take a look at how it was exemplified there in the book of Exodus and then see how it applies to us today. And so uh, starting at verse 8 of Exodus chapter 36, it begins a long section that ends the book. It's where the tabernacle described previously in the book of Exodus is now actually going to be built. And it's really something wonderful that we see. For example, in Exodus chapter 36, verses 8 through 13, it describes how they made the curtains of an artistic design of cherubim. It's what was commanded back in Exodus chapter 26. Here now in Exodus chapter 36, it's going to be fulfilled. So let me read these verses to you, starting at verse 8, Exodus chapter 36. Then all the gifted artisans among them who worked on the tabernacle made ten curtains woven of fine linen and of blue, purple, and scarlet thread. With artistic designs of cherubim they made them. The length of each curtain was 28 cubits and the width of each curtain was four cubits and the curtains were all the same size. And they coupled five curtains to win one another and the other five curtains he coupled to one another. And he made loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtains on the selvage of one set. Likewise, he did so on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. 50 loops he made on the one curtain and 50 loops he made on the edge of the curtain on the, other, on the end of the second set. The loops held one curtain to another. And he made 50 clasps of gold and coupled the curtains to one another with the clasps that it might be one tabernacle. No, I could just imagine somebody thinking here this morning, good heavens, there's four chapters of this? <laughs> with clasps and couples and curtains and cherubim and all the rest of it. What's this even getting at? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what we're talking about is the actual construction of this tabernacle, this tent that would be sort of a portable temple that Israel would build and keep with them throughout their wilderness wanderings. And on the outside of this tent, just like you would on any tent, you had coverings made of different materials. There was a curtain of goat's hair. There was a curtain of ram skin that was dyed red and a curtain of badger skins. Then there was the boards connecting the bars for the frame and the walls of the tabernacle. And then later on in Exodus chapter 36, it describes the veil and the screen and the pillars. And all these things were discussed previously in the book of Exodus. Now they're actually being built. And then all of a sudden we see all the description of these things. Then Exodus chapter 37 describes the construction of the tabernacle furniture. Well, there in Exodus chapter 37 verses 1 through 5, you have the Ark of the Covenant. And even if you don't know anything about the tabernacle, you know that there was an Ark of the Covenant there because you remember that great Indiana Jones movie where they sought out the Ark of the Covenant. Well, actually, I mean, the way they depicted the Ark of the Covenant wasn't so bad in that movie. 
But again, this is what symbolized God's throne among the people of Israel. And so they actually built what God commanded them to build. And then there was also the mercy seat, which was the golden lid to the Ark of the Covenant. That's described in Exodus chapter 37. Then in chapter 37, you have the description of the table of showbread. The table of showbread was a table that symbolized Israel's daily fellowship with God. Just like you have to eat bread every day, so bread was set before God in the tabernacle as a picture of that eating together in that fellowship. Then in chapter 37, you also have the mention of the golden lampstand, that light that was a light to Israel, a light to the tabernacle, and that speaks so powerfully of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Then you also have in chapter 37 described the altar of incense. It had its own incense and oil also constructed and made. This is where incense was offered to God. So you get the point, don't you? All of these things are just described. And then if you go through the chapter by chapter, you can find the descriptions. Now, I will say this, if you're interested in a more in-depth look at each one of these articles, if you want to know more about the altar of incense, if you want to know more about the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, on our website, we went through, and in a very detailed discussion, we went into our video studio over there, and myself and Nate Wagner and David Wally, we sat around a table with our open Bibles, and we just talked about these things piece by piece and article by article in greater depth. And so if you're interested in a greater in-depth examination, go to the website. Look for our conversational expositions through the book of Exodus, and you'll see in-depth studies on each one of these different articles. Well, then we're already to Exodus chapter 38. This describes the items that were associated with the outer court of the tabernacle. So you have the altar for sacrifice. This was the great altar mentioned in the first seven verses of Exodus chapter 38, where they would actually sacrifice the animals that were brought unto the Lord. Then you had the bronze laver, this sort of pool of washing water, where the priests would come and they would wash their hands and their feet before they conducted their priestly duties. By the way, if you would look at Exodus chapter 38, verse 8, there's something very fascinating there. I'm sure you're going to want to see this. Look at it. It says this, Exodus 38, 8. He made the laver of bronze and its base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Isn't that fascinating? When it comes time to make this bronze laver, what did they do? They took the mirrors from the women who served at the tabernacle. You see, way back in Exodus chapter 30, there's the original command to build this thing. But here, and only here, are we told where the raw materials, the actual brass or bronze came from. It came from the mirrors. Because you know in the ancient world, what they would use for mirrors was highly polished metal. And so you had all these mirrors, and the women came and surrendered their mirrors so that it could be used in the service of the tabernacle and to make this labor of washing. I don't know about you, but I think that that's wonderful. It's wonderful to think that these women gave up their ability to measure their own appearance, their own physical beauty, because that's what you use a mirror for, right? To measure your own appearance. You look in the mirror and you say, oh, I'm okay, or oh, I'm a mess, but you use it to measure your own appearance. They used it and gave them willingly, saying, no, 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 measuring my own outward appearance isn't so important to me anymore. I want this to go to the service of the Lord at his house. And by analogy, can't we say that there's something very powerful for us? I'll just say this by a spiritual analogy. There's some of us, you need to surrender your mirror unto God's service. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean by this, a mirror is something that you look at yourself in. And that's what you're really focused on in your walk with God. You're always measuring everything with how it affects you. You're always measuring everything. Not so much does it, does it reflect the glory of God, does it honor Him, but how does it reflect me? Me. Everything's his whole life, your whole spiritual experience is seen as if it's through a mirror. How does it mean to me? That's what's most important. Isn't it beautiful and powerful that these women said, you know what, at least for a time, how it appears to me isn't so important. I wanted to bring glory to our God in heaven. There's something very powerful, and obviously, that does not only apply to the women among us, does it? Sometimes men can be the most compulsive about looking, well, what does it mean to me? What's in it for me? Me, me, me. 
And the mirror would actually rather have us say, no, 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 how does it appear to Jesus Christ? Lord, I surrender to you this mirror of perpetual self-focus in my walk with you. And so it's very significant and a very powerful thing. I think it's also interesting that it speaks of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. It means that there was some kind of team of women who helped Moses and who helped the work of the tabernacle be conducted. We're not told that much about these women in the scriptures, but we're told that they are there. And so later on in Exodus chapter 38, after verse 8, verses 9 through 20, describe the construction of the court with its pillars and its linen fence. And then Exodus chapter 38 continues with an inventory of the materials for the building of the tabernacle. First you have an inventory of the people. That's in verses 21 through 23. Then you have an inventory of the gold, an inventory of the silver, an inventory of the bronze, and they make all of that concluding to the end of chapter 38. Now again, I gotta say, I'm just fascinated by this idea that they had such good management over this building project that they inventoried all the materials. This wasn't some slapdash, you know, fly by the seat of your pants kind of thing. They had it planned, they had it measured, they had it inventoried, they knew what they were doing with the construction of this tabernacle. Well then, Exodus chapter 39, it describes the making of the priestly garments. For example, there was something that the high priest wore that was called an ephod, something like a long apron that the high priest would wear. And then there was a breastplate for the high priest, and a robe for the high priest, and tunics, and turbans, and sashes, and trousers for all the priests. That makes up most of Exodus chapter 39. And again, I just think it's very revealing that God commanded that they be built and that they be made way back, now they are actually being done. Then at the end of Exodus chapter 39, Moses looks over all the work and it describes for us how he had an overview of the construction project. Look at it here. Exodus chapter 39, starting at verse 42. It says, according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did all the work. Then Moses looked over all the work and indeed they had done it. As the Lord had commanded, just so they had done it, and Moses blessed them. Well, Moses was the leader in charge of the work. I mean, he wasn't the guy necessarily swinging the hammer or shaping the gold or that stuff, but he had a responsibility and oversight over the entire work. And so it says there quite appropriately that he looked over all the work. And so God gave him the pattern to build it up on Mount Sinai. Now he's making sure and showing that it is built according to that power, powder, um, pattern, I should say. And then in verse 43, it says, as the Lord commanded, just so they had done it. That's beautiful obedience. God commanded it and they did it. So now in chapter 40, can you believe it? We're already to chapter 40. The tabernacle's assembled. It's as if they've built each individual component. Now they're going to put the whole thing together as a collective whole. So the first five verses describe how the furniture in the tabernacle tent is arranged. Then verses 6 through 11 say how the items are arranged in the tabernacle courtyard. Then verses 12 through 16 remind them of the ceremony to consecrate the priests for their service. And 17 through 19 describe the assembly of the tent with the boards and its curtains. And then each part of the tabernacle is described in its setting. Look at it now, starting at verse 20 of Exodus chapter 40. Look at it with me. He took the testimony and put it into the ark, inserted the poles through the rings of the ark, and put the mercy seat on top of the ark. Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle, hung up the veil of the covering, and partitioned off the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. Okay, assemble the ark, put it into the most holy place there it sits. Now verse 22. He put the table in the tabernacle of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle, outside the veil, and he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord, as the Lord had commanded Moses. There's the table of showbread in the most holy place. Then verse 24. He put the lampstand in the tabernacle of meeting across from the table on the south side of the tabernacle, and he lit the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. Then verse 26, the golden altar of incense. He put the gold altar of the tabernacle of meeting in front of the veil and he burned sweet incense on it as the Lord commanded Moses. 
Verse 28, the screen is put up. He hung up the screen of the door of the tabernacle. Verse 29, the brazen altar. And he put the altar of burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered upon it burnt offering and grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. And then finally here, verse 30 of uh, chapter 40. He set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and he put the water there for washing. And Moses, Aaron, and his sons would wash their hands and their feet with water from it. Whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting and whenever they came near the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now again, it's just this beautiful description of putting all the ingredients together. You've got to say it's kind of exciting. You know, the end part of a building project is always exciting, isn't it? When you're collecting the resources, oh, sometimes that's kind of difficult. And when you're in the beginning parts of the work, all the foundational work, sometimes that's difficult. But man, when everything starts coming together and the permits are being signed off and everything's working through, it's all great. And yes, this is wonderful. And that's exactly where Israel was at this place. At the end of the book of Exodus, the tabernacle is built. There they are at camp at the foot of Mount Sinai, waiting God's direction for their future. But they say, yes, Lord, you commanded us to build this tabernacle and and we built it. But in those verses that I read to you from the second half of Exodus chapter 40, I'm wondering if you noticed the repetition of a certain phrase. Did you notice that? What was that phrase that was repeated so often? As the Lord had commanded Moses. Did you see it there? As the Lord had commanded Moses. As the Lord had commanded Moses over and over again. Matter of fact, in this section of scripture that we're considering, Exodus chapters 36 through chapter 40, that phrase or something very similar to it is used some 19 times in just those four verses. Over and over and over again. You know what this reminds us of, friends? Doesn't it remind us very powerfully of the importance of obedience? You know, it's strange. I say that word, obedience, and even as I say it, and it hangs out in the air over this room, I wonder how it sounds in the ears of many people. I wonder what it would be like, and if you, if you were to walk up and down State Street this afternoon and tell people, it is important to obey God. Good heavens, could you imagine the, the, the calamity that that would... Could, could, can you imagine the... Uh, the the disapproval one would gain from simply making such a statement as that. It is important to obey God. Say it up and down the State Street. Say it at the university campus. Say it out in the community. Say it out on Stern's Wharf this afternoon. Just shout it out if you feel like it. It is important to obey God. Now, what's interesting? Rationally speaking, that is completely an uncontroversial statement. If there is a God enthroned in heaven, and if he has communicated to us and given us a great message through his own son, Jesus Christ, then there is nothing more important in this world or the next than obeying him. Now, if it's all just a big story, if it's all like Hansel and Gretel and, you know, breadcrumbs back to the house and that kind of stuff, well, then it is irrelevant. Then just go ahead. Then just live for yourself die to yourself. There is no thing in heaven or above or beneath or anything. If it's all a fable, then it's all a fable. But ladies and gentlemen, if it's true, then that is a completely uncontroversial statement. It is important to obey God. But there's something in me. I'm not going to say it's in you. I have my suspicions, but I'll say it's in me. There's something in me that says, I don't want to obey God. I want to follow whatever inclinations I feel like at the time. It's why it's difficult to go on a diet, isn't it? When you put yourself under that kind of discipline to say, I'm going to control these desires for supposedly a higher good, you find out just how difficult it can be. But you know, you'll find that some people who have no difficulty whatsoever in regulating their diet may have tremendous difficulty in regulating something else in their life. And each and every one of us has to deal with this issue of obedience. It is so profound, it is so significant that it's written all over these four chapters as the Lord had commanded Moses. 
It reminds us of the importance of obedience. It reminds us of something. I'm going to use a phrase, and I hope it doesn't strike anybody as strange, but I'll use it. It reminds us of something that the Bible calls the beauty of holiness. Oh, holiness. Boy, I think if there's any phrase that's more weird to our society than obedience, it must be holiness. But the Bible speaks of this beautiful concept of holiness, of this idea that we can be separated unto God, separated away from the tyranny of myself with its sinful inclinations and desires, separated away from perhaps a world that in many ways disregards and pushes away God and separated from those kind of things and instead separated unto God to a relationship of love and trust in him. The Bible speaks of that as being something that's beautiful. The beauty of holiness. Friends, if those ideas of obedience and holiness are ugly to you and not not beautiful, let me sincerely say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because there may very well be some person or some people in your life that have sort of misrepresented what obedience and holiness are all alike. And they've portrayed something that should be beautiful and portrayed it to you in a way that's made it seem so ugly. And if that's the case, I'm genuinely sorry. But I say with great sincerity as well, I want your eyes to be open to the truth of how beautiful it is to obey God and to be in true alignment, to be in true fellowship, in true connection with the God who created you and died for you on a cross. And how beautiful it is to have a life that in some powerful sense is separated unto him. You see, there's something powerful in this phrase and the emphasis of it, as the Lord commanded Moses. We're working on now in Exodus chapter 40, verse 33 describes how they set up the outer court. It says, and they raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar, and he hung up the screen of the court gate. So Moses finished the work. And so when the tabernacle was all finally assembled and finished, it was an earthly model of a heavenly reality. It's startling for us to understand, but God told Moses on Mount Sinai that he was to build it according to a pattern, and the reality, the original of that pattern, exists in heaven. I'm not trying to say that God lives in a tent in heaven, like the tabernacle was a tent. No, that's not the idea at all. But there's something about the construction, there's something about the analogy, there's something about the message of the tabernacle that corresponds in a powerful and beautiful way to a heavenly reality. And we're confronted with this time and again in the scriptures, actually. In the book of Revelation, chapter 4, you know what we see up there in heaven? We see an Ark of the Covenant in heaven. It's strange. Now, I don't know, there's scholars who debate whether it's the Ark of the Covenant or a heavenly, you know, perfection of it, but there's an Ark of the Covenant in Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 8, it describes the altar of incense in heaven. Just as there was one down in the earthly pattern, so there was up in the heavenly original. In Isaiah chapter 6, the tabernacle structure is implied by the mention of the temple. And there's also a mention of the brazen altar that Moses was commanded to build. And then in Hebrews chapter 9, you can consider this a little bit of a preview for the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 9, at verse 23, it tells us that at some point in time, after he finished his sacrificial work of atonement on the cross, that Jesus entered the heavenly reality that's represented on earth by the tabernacle. And he appeared in that heavenly reality in the presence of God the Father to offer a perfect atonement for our sins. Therefore, every time before that final event, after the crucifixion of Jesus... When the high priest made atonement in the earthly tabernacle, you could say that it was play acting. It was a preview. It was the trailer before the movie that looked forward to the perfect atonement of the Son of God that he would eventually offer. And so you see there's a direct, beautiful, powerful line of continuity all the way back from the tabernacle up to the glorious, wonderful work of Jesus 
of humanity there on the cross. Now the last few verses of the book of Exodus describe what happened when it was all complete. When they'd finished this work of building the tabernacle. What happened? Well, you'll see what happened. Look at it here at verse 40. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. How's that for like a, you know, an opening service for the church? There they are, they build the tabernacle, they finish it. Moses is looking over all the work. No, not that big, no, that, that small. Make this a little different, a little better quality there. No, let's build it this way. He's supervising all the details, the work gets done, they assemble it together, and then they say, good, now we're ready to conduct real, live, priestly service. And as the priests come in, led by Moses, to begin that priestly work in the tabernacle, what happens? We're told right there, verse 34, that the cloud that covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. How beautiful is that? God was pleased with the obedience of Israel. And, and it wasn't so much because it's saying, well, good, you know, now you know I'm boss because you'll obey me. No, that's not why God is pleased with our obedience. But it was more to display that they really did believe him and that they really did love him. Now friends, there's a real and a significant line of continuation between the continually mentioned obedience of Moses. We saw it repeated so many times, right? As the Lord commanded Moses. As the Lord had commanded Moses. Over and over again. We see all that remarkable obedience and we see it stretching out to this remarkable display of glory. And we shouldn't think that Israel or Moses earned this display of glory, but yet you could say this, their obedience welcomed the display of glory. And it's an enduring principle. You and I, all of us collectively and individually, we need God to rescue us. We need him to rescue us from ourselves. We need us to rescue us from this present age. And we need him to rescue us for the age to come. But none of us earn our own rescue before God. I, I hate to tell you, there's not a chart in heaven that you're going to get a gold star on because of your church attendance today. God isn't measuring that. He's not telling you to earn your rescue, but by attending this many times or giving this much money or participating in these activities. No, he wants to freely give you that rescue by a relationship of love and trust. But if you really love him, if you really trust him, it'll show in obedience. There is blessing there. I don't know why, but in the preparation for this message, a, a connected verse came to my mind with this. And I'm just going to read the verse because I think that maybe God has this as a special word for somebody here today. But this verse from Proverbs illustrates the same idea so powerfully. Ready for this? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That's what he was going to do for Israel by the manifested glory of his presence. And the glory was so great, you saw it right there in verse 35, that Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. The same thing happened later when Solomon opened the temple that was built many centuries later. It shows us the importance of this, friends. That without God's glory and presence, it was just a tent. Oh, it was a nice tent. It was a nice tent with gold-covered boards. It was a nice tent with awesome furniture inside of it. It was a nice tent, you know, with an altar outside of it. But without the indwelling glory of God, something profound was missing. Isn't that true of your life? Without the indwelling glory of God, Something profound is missing. Well, how do you have it? You come to Jesus with this relationship of love and trust in him. 
You say, Jesus, rescue me. Jesus, I here officially give up on trying to rescue myself. I ask you to come and rescue me. I trust you. I love you. And I want it to show in obedience in my life. Let's look now to the end of the book. Verse 36. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not journey till that day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and the fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Do you see it here, friends? The glory was so important to Israel that it guided them. And when that cloud of glory began to move, they understood God wants me to move. When it stayed in one place, they understood God wants me to stay in one place. And we see here that God did answer Moses' prayer. He sent his glory among them. And I love how it phrases there in verse 38, that it was with them there throughout all their journeys. The, the book of Exodus actually ends with great hope and trust in God. Even though Israel had shown rebellion, and even though they had that debacle at the golden calf, and even though they had been stiff-necked and rebellious against God, yet God says, trust in me, obey me, I will live among you and guide you by my glory. All that is beautiful. But do you understand it was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ? I'm going to end with this. John chapter 1, verse 14, the Apostle John wrote this. And the world became flesh and dwelt among us. Now that word that he used, the Apostle John, when he wrote dwelt, he deliberately chose a fascinating word that could actually be translated tabernacled. It's a very deliberate reference back to this tent that Moses and the people of Israel just built in Exodus chapters 36 through 40. That Jesus tabernacled among us. And it's as if John wants us to know something. John's casting a line way back to Exodus chapter 40. And he's saying, just as the glory of God dwelt with Israel in the tabernacle, so the glory of God dwelt among us as Jesus, the Son of God, tabernacled among us. Ladies and gentlemen, to have Jesus fill your life is to have the glory of God fill your life. Now I hope you're not pushing him away. I hope you give an open invitation to Jesus right here, right now. And I'm going to do something now in the conclusion of my message. I'm going to pray in just a moment. And in the midst of my prayer, I'm going to give an invitation to anybody who would like to receive Jesus Christ. You say, I want this indwelling glory in my life. And look, I know that it may be awkward or maybe uncomfortable for some people here, but I want you to know that my point, my reason for this is not to make anybody awkward or uncomfortable. My point in doing this is saying, how could I present you this message of the indwelling glory of Jesus Christ without giving somebody the opportunity to receive it? And so in the midst of my prayer, I'm going to give an invitation. It'll be a very brief, a very direct invitation, but I'm going to invite you to stand if you want to receive Jesus Christ this morning. And then I'm going to leave it to you as you stand. A prayer team will come up a little bit later in our service, and you'll need to connect with them and pray with them. But this will be your opportunity now to receive this indwelling glory that is just as real for us today as it was for ancient Israel. Would you pray with me now? Father in heaven, I pray, and I ask that you would uh, move upon hearts this morning to receive something from you, Jesus. I pray that the words of the preacher would fade uh, in the minds now, that the words of the Holy Spirit of God would speak so powerfully and eloquently to hearts. Because, Lord, it's not my intention this morning to talk anyone into your kingdom. Lord, if I can talk them into it, somebody else can talk them out of it. But, God, I pray that your spirit would speak powerfully to hearts right now, even as you spoke to me many years ago, saying, this is right, this is true, this is what you must do with your life. So speak to them now, Lord, as I give an invitation. Now, friends, where heads are bowed and eyes are reverently closed before the Lord, I just simply ask, who here would like to receive Jesus Christ? 
Who here would like to put your love and your trust in him and live after him with your life? If that's you this morning, would you please stand up? Again, the point of you standing, bless you, sir. The point of you standing isn't to embarrass you, but it's simply to say that you're going to do something to say, I believe, I put my trust in Jesus. Others here this morning. Bless you, sir. Others here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'll give a few more minutes, I know. I'm wondering if uh, this morning might not be the answer to prayers from many praying mothers. Anyone else here this morning? Father, I pray for these who have stood. You hear the sincerity of their heart crying out to you, Jesus, I want you. And so, Jesus, I pray that, um, that you would lead them to trust in you and in what you have done on the cross. Lord, we know that we don't earn our salvation by standing up in a church meeting. But, Lord, we, we trust in you, Jesus, to save us. And I thank you for these who have stood as a demonstration of that trust. Won't you forgive them? Won't you bless them? Won't you fill them with your spirit? Won't you pour out your grace and indwell them with your glory? Do it, Lord. Pour out your spirit among us. In Jesus' name, amen.